Dieter Lipinski is a working clairvoyant medium who is also a writer and meditation coach. She is also a survivor, a visionary, an all-around precious human being who wants nothing more than to show others how to transform and transcend the troublesome patterns of anxiety, the desire to control, negative self-talk, the need to judge others, and the destructive habit of gossip. Nita Lipinski, welcome to the show. So you have quite a life story that you detail in your book, The Knowing, Awake in the Dark. Uh, in that book, you're very open, honest, and raw. How difficult was it to write that book? Well, it was difficult for many, many reasons, not mm. just for the obvious. Um, yeah, it was, you know, I think like many people would tell you, it's very cathartic when I, I didn't write it for years because I was afraid, you know, mm. I was afraid for my children and afraid to just tell the truth because, you know, I have lived, as I say in my book, I've lived a life easily judged. Mm. So, yeah. But it was a cathartic experience to get those words on paper. It was. Yeah. Okay. I've, I found that and it's not only in my own life, but talking to other writers, how the power of language, it's, it's amazing the power it has to, I don't know what you want to say, like cleanse us or get, because I think as we as humans have a tendency to compartmentalize a lot of times and, and take unpleasant parts of ourselves or those experiences or things that we want to hide from other, kind of lock them away. And it's like language can be the key to open those doors that somehow makes it acceptable and a way of getting that out <laughs> into the open so we can actually deal with it because it's tough to deal with something if you're keeping it locked inside or maybe you're pretending it's not there or it didn't happen. Right. And I mean, when you think about all of the people who have journals and who write right. and are able to use that modality to tell the truth. And just, you know, say whatever they need to say in those right. words. Right. Very powerful. So, I mean, you've obviously, you've faced a lot of obstacles, difficult times in your life. Do you think difficulty happens for a reason or is it simply luck of the draw? <laughs> uh, I think everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't... Um, I mean, there's probably luck, but not in large ways like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. As mentioned in the introduction, you are a clairvoyant medium. Uh, for those listeners who may not be familiar with that, could you explain a little about clairs and what it means to be clairvoyant? Yes. Um, and And I will say to you that really... When I wrote this book, I talked to a lot of people, a lot of groups. I, I do a lot of workshops. It took me a long time to say I'm a clairvoyant medium hmm. because there's such, I think, misconception around it. So I was born with what we call the five clairs, which are five abilities that most people have some of. So clairvoyance, the ability to see things without having to be present or there to see them, right? Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Clairalience, which is the ability to smell like, you know, your grandmother had a certain smell or somebody you loved and they passed and you can smell things that don't appear to be present. Mm -hmm. Claircognizant, which is the feeling in your gut, which I would venture you probably have a lot. Mm. Um, just that feeling of knowing without empirical evidence. Right. Um, clairsentient, which a lot of people have that. It's the ability to know what others are feeling without them telling you. So how many did I do? 
Um, I was I was listening. I wasn't counting. <laughs> Clairvoyance, clairalliance, clairsentient. I'm missing one. Um, hmm. So I what I guess what I'm hearing is that there are some people who have one or more, and there are some people like yourself who have all of them. Yes. Okay. Is that a blessing or a curse to you? You know, I, I don't know any other way to be. I, I don't, um, people ask me that. And the thing is, is I can't imagine life without knowing and understanding and seeing the things I have always had. So, you know, I, I can't really say is it a curse. I, I've always just been that way. So, when do you first remember realizing that you had these clairs? I, you know, I tell my I open my book the knowing. I was raised Mormon, mm -hmm. and so we went to church for hours on Sunday. And I was probably seven years old and in church and the bishop was, you know, talking, doing his sermon. And I noticed, I saw what I thought was, you know, these shoot at this shooting stars hmm. in at the ceiling of the sanctuary. And I'm looking up at it and I thought, oh, that's God. God hmm. is like shooting around the ceiling and you know i i thought why isn't everybody looking at god <laughs> <laughs> but nobody looked right they yeah. everybody just sat in their stiff clothes and hard pews and paid attention to the bishop and that was the first time i was like wow hmm. you know why doesn't anybody else see god you know so I think that was the first time. When was the first time you tried to talk to someone about these gifts that you had? Uh, around seven or eight, hmm. you know, I said different things and people would just look at you and not like, almost like you were speaking a different language and they yeah. just would dismiss you, you know? like you're just crazy hmm. so you learn oh maybe maybe i shouldn't say that i mean i shouldn't you know say the things i say which never really caught on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well i can imagine though you know growing up and and having I guess in a way being silenced just from the fact that you didn't want to deal with people's reactions to it, understandably so, would make it difficult later on, for example, when you were writing The Knowing, um, to really come out and be completely honest about that sort of thing. When you wrote that book, was that the first time that you were really open about it? Just on, at least on uh, that platform? Yes. And I had been married. How long had we been married by then? Uh, like maybe 15 years. Hmm. And my husband comes from a large Catholic family. And, you know, some of the siblings knew that I was kind of different, you know, and, um, but they didn't know, they didn't know hmm. my story or what, what I really knew. And I was worried about that with my husband. I was like, what, you know, what's going to happen with your family, you know? Yeah. And he, he was, he said, it's who you are. You have a gift. Oh. Just tell it. So it was with that encouragement, that oh. encouragement helped me a lot, you know, right. to know that he, it didn't matter to him. That must have been something to receive that sort of response, which I imagine was the sort of response you had been looking for for years right still looking yeah <laughs> <laughs> still looking still searching yeah. well regardless of that you have a lot to offer people so i want to move on to talking about you know your work 
uh, a little bit. So you write a lot about anxiety and fear and how we as humans can learn to transcend those struggles. Do you think anxiety and fear are a natural part of the human condition that we just have to learn to deal with? Or is it an unnatural thing placed on us by circumstances or our environment? Oh, we definitely learn it. Hmm. Yeah, I think that, so when you think about hearing, don't run, you're going to fall and hurt yourself. Don't touch that. It's hot. You're going to get burned. Hmm. Don't go in the street. You're going to get hit by a car. <laughs> right. Right. So before you can say your name, hmm. you're taught to think anxiously, to anticipate a bad outcome and that if you think anxiously and anticipate bad outcomes it'll keep you safe mm. so you know you grow up you you've been fearful thinking so long you don't recognize it mm. you know you don't you don't know that you're thinking fearfully because shoot you've been thinking that way your whole life before you could even say your name. Right. right. So we learn it for sure. And society keeps telling us that that's right. You better watch out. You better be careful, you know. Well, why is, do you think society does that? Because they're afraid. They're afraid <laughs> themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And does it have something to do with maybe the imp the imposition of fear on others that helps us control our own fear. I'm trying to figure out that dynamic. It can, well, first of all, fear is about control, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you control, you think if you can control an outcome, then you're safe because you've always thought that. But unfortunately, society, religions, you know, politics, there is so much fear laced in everything sure. telling you, you better be careful, you know, because there are things that something, something is waiting for you. Mm. You know, the other shoe is going to drop, right. you know, you, you just, it is the world we live in. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. So if there is somebody who is watching or listening to us, who struggles with anxiety, fear, depression, where would you tell them to begin the journey out of that struggle? You have to become mindful of your own thoughts. Hmm. You have to learn to identify your own fearful thinking, right? And that's number one, to become aware of it then there are lots of ways to get out of anxiety. You know, I teach one way, but it's not the only way. There's lots of ways there. You know, yoga is so awesome for people because yoga forces you to be present. And fear is about anticipating an outcome that has not occurred. That's going to be bad, right? So you're not present. So people don't know how to be present. So anything you can do to be present, whether it's using breath, whether it's meditation, whether it's prayer, whether it's yoga, martial arts, you know, then you, that is going to take you out of anxiety. And when you start to notice and see and get yourself out of it, then you start to have power. And you realize that your mind does not think independently of you. So people with anxiety say, I can't help it. I can't stop it. You know, I, my mind, I don't want to think these things, but my mind is just thinking them. Hmm. And, and I understand, you know, that it feels that way. But the fact is your brain does not think independently of you. Hmm. You tell it how to think. So you taught it to think fearfully. You can learn a different way. Yeah, it's sort of like, um, you know, people complain about how their children are acting in, in certain, certain situations. And I look on like, 
that you taught that child to act that way. <laughs> That's right. And now you're embarrassed because you think their behavior is about you. Right. That's the other part. You know, parents are like, oh, my child said such and such and that's a reflection of them and their bad parenting skills they think yeah so (laughs) it's a whole convoluted mess yeah (laughs) awesome well uh needle lipinski thank you so much for coming on the show i do want to though before we go where can people find out more about you online they can go to my website it is my name nita lipinski.com um I'm on Facebook. They can friend me on Facebook, Needle Lipinski. Yeah. All right. So uh, is there anything you're working on right now, something that we can look forward to from you? Yes, I'm so excited. I'm starting a new book. Are you? Awesome. I'm working right now. I finally learned after, what, four, four books, for three books and short stories that maybe I should start with a storyboard and Mm. cards and how it's flowing and what I want to say. And so I'm working on that and writing some stuff at the same time. And of course it is um, metaphysical because that's my passion. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's about its current events. It's what's going on in our world. And so, yeah. Is it a novel or nonfiction? It's going to be fiction. Okay. Um, awesome. Okay. I mean, I call it fiction, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote this fiction for people. So, yeah, we call it fiction. Um, yeah, it's, you know, what can I say about it? That's, it'll, it's about children, twins, which you know something about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but this is a boy and a girl, mm-hmm. twins. And one has died, mm. but the uh, the other sees, talks, interacts, has normal life experiences with this twin, though they know the other one has passed. Mm. And then there's some twists and turns in there. Naturally. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that. And, you know, maybe when it's out, you come back on and we can chat about that for a little bit as well. I so. Hope so. All right. Nita Lipinski, thanks so much for coming on the show.